Good evening. Thank you for joining us for another of our TeleArtworks online lectures. Uh, before we begin, I should like to give you some information about the Atelier at Flowerfield, a 5013C not-for-profit organization. Our Spring 3 session has just started um, and classes are still open for registration on the website um, and it will continue until uh, just before July 4th. Um, but it's worth checking the website out because the length of some of the classes is varying. Um, so it's worth checking it out. Um, the website is atelierflowerfield.org. We offer a variety of fine art drawing and painting classes in a variety of mediums, both online and in studio. And we offer classes in illustration and digital painting as well. We've also created a group of portfolio prep classes for students wishing to apply to art school, and they will run right through the summer. Um, we have a variety of paintings on sale in our online art shop. Details again can be found on our website. Um, our next exhibition is our annual Emerging Artists Show featuring works by our own students, both past and present. The opening reception for that will be on June 10th from 5.30 to 7.30. And it actually is also in conjunction with um, a celebration of the Atelier, um, which we held in the courtyard, weather permitting. So it will be a nice catered reception. I hope you'll all join us. Um, and that exhibition will continue until July 27th. The gallery is open Monday through Saturday, nine to five. Tonight, our instructor, Randall Giuseppe, is presenting a lecture about the history and art of figure drawing called Figure Drawing, The Naked Truth. We welcome him this evening and hope you enjoy tonight's lecture. If you wish to ask questions, please post them in the chat room. I shall now hand over to Randall Di Giuseppe. Thank you, Gabby. And thank you all for joining me this evening to discuss what is, uh, Perhaps my favorite exercise in drawing and uh, arguably the most challenging exercise in, in, in the, uh, well, one could argue in the entire realm of Western art, drawing the human figure on a two-dimensional surface. We're gonna be discussing uh, the history of it and the evolution and how figure drawing uh, came to pass. We'll be looking at a range of drawings going back to, uh, well, 17,000 years up to the modern era. So there's a lot of information that we'll be covering. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of hopscotching as, as well. Um, I should just jump right in and get started. Human figure. We have an innate understanding of the human figure. Um, we may not have, know how to draw it. We may not know all the pieces of the human body, but just from the human experience, we know when things are off. And therein lies the challenge with the human figure. This form gives me the opportunity to show some of my work. This happens to be one of, one of my own drawings. Uh, the way I break these courses down uh, are usually in three parts with five minute breaks in between so that uh, the uh, volume of information, it doesn't get too, too overwhelming. Yeah, you can stop for a break and collect your thoughts to. Um, ask some questions. This is one of my own drawings. It gives me an opportunity here at this form to show some of my own work along with some of my other favorite artists' work. Uh, this was done roughly 10 years ago uh, from a live model. We teach here, but the artistic lineage that I follow can be traced all the way back to the Renaissance as far as how I, uh, how I do my drawings and how I teach my students. This is 200 years prior by a draft uh, by a draftsman named Pierre Paul Proudhon, uh, one of the greatest draftsmen uh, of the human figure in Western art. We're going to keep the form in, uh, the form primarily for our purposes within the realm of Western art. There isn't a very large tradition of nude drawings and paintings in the Eastern realm. There is some in India, but by and large, uh, not a lot. Not drawing the the the, the nude model in and of itself, the, the human form. The first uh, part of this, we'll be looking at from the Paleolithic age up to uh, the height of the Roman Empire. That's seven, roughly 15,000 years of history, but the good news is there's not a lot in between because unfortunately the medium of drawing is a highly perishable medium. Uh, the uh, mediums erode, the surfaces tend to fade or break, and there's there tends to not be a lot of it. But when we do find um, a drawing, it's, it's quite fantastic. Then we're gonna go into part two, where we discuss the Renaissance and the rebirth of the appreciation of the human figure uh, into the Romantic era, into the mid 1800s. And then we go into the um, 
influence of the Industrial Revolution and the rise of the camera and how it affected, well, not just art in general, but um, how it affected the human figure and how we handle it in art. This image here, starting very, very late, is the earliest human image uh, that's been depicted or at least been discovered. Circa 17,000 BC, according to uh, uh, the latest uh, numbers. It's, this, is a, this was found in a cave in Lascaux in France in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, again, circa 17,000 years, 15,000 BC. It is assumed that this uh, figure is a male, probably a, a shaman wearing a bird mask or someone with a very large nose. It's not very well drawn, but we get to see an image like this, for instance. This is assumed to be the genitalia as this object is as he's either falling back or falling down. But what, what we're going to explore today is how do we go from this to this, which is a, a modern master, Stephen Nacelle. Uh, this is a graphite drawing of a reclined figure done well, within the past five years, I'm guessing. I'm fortunate enough to know him and learn with him. And uh, we'll continue. As I mentioned earlier, there's not a lot of, of, of surviving drawings of the human figure. The earliest depiction that we found so far is this Venus of Wittendorf that was found in Germany in the, in the previous century, early in the 20th, late 19th century. Most of these figures are roughly four inches, three inches high, highly exaggerated. Um, genitalia, the female, they think these were probably fertility charms, the large belly, the, the, the wide waist, uh, something that was probably not quite readily available back in the Paleolithic age. It was probably very hard to find anything to eat. This goes back to 25,000 BC. It's one of the earliest. Uh, there may be an early one out there. We yet to find it. This is another uh, image of a, of a female nude, probably a, a fertility uh, item as well. What's interesting about this is that you see that there is an attempt to paint on the surface. This is the Venus of Flacel, also found uh, last century using terracotta paint. Breasts are augmented, clearly a female figure. Uh, the face looks like there's a mask and there's some symbolic horn. Not entirely sure what that's for. It falls under this variety, this, this category of, of fertility charms that were found um, in about the Spanish and French and uh, German borders uh, over the past hundred years. And since they didn't write anything down, or if they did write anything down, uh, we don't have anything that survives. We can only surmise that these were fertility charms. Going back to um, the previous sample, the cave in Lascaux, most of the drawings that survive are usually not of the human figure. They're uh, usually of some, some form of wildlife and wild game, probably something they were trying to eat, something that was very important to them at that time. And going back to this more detailed image, the earliest image that we have of the bird man, we're assuming that's genitalia. He's leaning back, either fallen back or, or, or on the ground. Telling a story, this here is a disgruntled bison that has been disemboweled. As you can see, the, the bowels here and there's a spear running through. This looks to be a staff. There's a lot of mystery here. There are more questions than answers. But this is one of the earliest true depictions of a human figure, so far as we can tell. It's another detail of this image, as you can see. Not a lot going on. There isn't really much of a concern for, for anatomical accuracy. The number of fingers seem to be four, very cartoonish. The head, the head of a bird, we can see that was a mask. This for me is one of the most mysterious objects. It also, uh, the, in the Madeleine Caves of France, found last century as well, the early, in the early part of the century. These are, are bas reliefs that were found uh, deep in a cave. They're figuring circa, there's some controversies to how old they are, but they're of the Paleolithic age. They're a very light relief and they're painted over with uh, either um, some plant or mineral tone. Looks like there's some terracotta here, but it's pretty clear that these two objects are of the human figure. This is an outline of the same. This may be well, this is a rather advanced concept of what that previous drawing is here, but it's pretty clear that the female nude figure 
in and of itself is being depicted this very early on in history. And then there's a huge bounce. There isn't much going on from 13,000 until the Neolithic. There really, if there is, there isn't much information that's available. You start seeing in some of the Egyptian uh, murals and tombs, some depictions of uh, right in here, naked dancers. Fascinating piece here, just in and of itself. You have the Egyptian murals tend to have them in profile. Here you have the faces turned um, facing forward and the feet are bent in and, then you, and you have these four shortened arms. So there's this, there's this um, depiction of three dimensional uh, space on this flat surface. And obviously these, these females are dancing naked to the musicians here. They may have had an influence later on on the Minoans farther north of, of, of Egypt. This is a, re a restoration of uh, three topless women of uh, this mural, uh, Ladies in Blue on the Island of Crete, uh, roughly the same time. The, the Minoans seem to have, uh, they, they seem to have a much stronger influence from the, the Egyptians and the Asiatic tribes than the Greeks, even though they, they, they tend to be uh, lumped in with the Greeks. This is another early depiction of a nude male from Akwatiri, 1500 BC, just a century removed from the other image that we have. Again, we're only going on what we can find, and this is an example of that. There's not a lot. But when we do, we just get really excited. We can find any painting at all. Most of what uh, survives from the Paleolithic up to the classical period tends to be um, of the three-dimensional nature, because stone just lasts longer than paint. We're starting to see uh, in Greek culture a strong appreciation for the human figure specifically the male nude figure. And, and you can see from the previous slide and this one here, the Krosos Kuros, which simply means young boy, that there is now a very uh, st strict attention to detail to anatomy. Not only that, but idealized anatomy, these strong thighs and, and this tapered waist and the pectoral muscles. This is a strong, young, athletic boy. This is 650 BC. Now, are there any drawings that exist from this period? Again, not a lot, but we do see that as the uh, medium of, of Greek sculpture evolves, they were masters at manipulating uh, the material to be freestanding. Most Greek sculptures, like this Riachi warrior, there are very few that survive, were freestanding. They did not have a strut that held them up. They just, it's standing alone. So the original uh, Discobolos, uh, this is a this is a replica. The one that's been lost actually stood uh, without any support, just in of itself. And here is a copy of the Venus de Milo, one of the most famous female nudes, which was probably, but well, most definitely, actually uh, painted with polychrome paint. We tend to look at classical uh, uh, nude models as being uh, whitewashed, but the fact is, is they were actually very colorful and uh, painted over many times over. We have any Greek paintings that exist of nude figures, they are in the pottery, such as this amphora. So you have nude males and females dancing in a festival, I'm not entirely sure uh, the nature of this festival. Most of the time they were depicted, they were depicting uh, uh, scenes in, in famous Greek epics. Here we have four nude objects on another uh, vase at the British Museum, around the same time as the Kouros, as you can see, in this sculpture, we're starting to see some attention to detail in the drawing of these lines or contour lines. And there's a, there's a very uh, specific breakdown of the muscles. We see the pectorals, we see the, the deltoid, the bicep, tricep, the brachioradialis. All of this is broken out. These aren't just arbitrary lumps of mass. The Greeks were paying very strict attention to the human figure, even at this point. So. I wager that they did have lots of these paintings. They just simply didn't survive through time. I mean, it's hard enough to keep a, a painting alive for a hundred years, let alone two and a half thousand years. Some other images you'll see uh, on, on Greek pottery. Again, the male nude figure. And you'll, you quite often you see more male nudes than female nudes. And that had to do with the ideology and the, it, 
in, in a lot of the ancient Greek mindset that the, the male nude model was the measure of all things. This is one of the magnum opuses of the, well, this is a Roman replica of a Greek statue that stands eight feet tall called the Laocoon. So the Romans are getting in on the action here. They were strongly influenced by the Greeks. Again, not a lot of paintings. These were the things that were readily available to us uh, for many, many years. You can see here for, uh, from the Kuros up until the, the 600 years, the amount of detail in the, in the twisting of the torso and the ranges of motion and the activation of certain muscles. This vein popping out as he's struggling with this snake, it's phenomenal. Even though it's not a drawing, it's important that I bring it up. Um, there was very little known about Roman paintings up until uh, this monumentous period in history, August 24, 79 AD, there was a seaside town by the name of Pompeii. Here is an image of it, modern day. Um, to point out that this here is Mount Vesuvius. Back on August 23rd, 79 AD, this, this uh, live volcano actually went up this tall. So this entire mass is, is gone because it blasted off and landed on the entire city of Pompeii and adjacent Herculaneum. But unfortunately to their detriment and their demise, nobody survived this attack. It preserved the city. And what made it so important was not only did it preserve this Roman culture in a specific era, but a specific moment in time. And with that were these newly found murals that were done by the Roman artisans showing that these frescoes, they, they had a pretty clear understanding of, of, of the human figure and light and dark. So these are the first true images of two-dimensional images of, of the nude figure in light and dark, in proportion, contrapposto. And these are all preserved under the rubble that was uh, piled on by Mount Vesuvius in Pompeii. Here's another image. Uh, this is uh, one of the images of, of Venus. Uh, seducing Mars. Again, look at this beautiful, it's a beautiful composition in of itself, the way the light catches the metal on the bronze, but the way the, the female figure is this, has this graceful arabesque. Probably got to use this pose in my class one of these days. Then you have these other images, more secular. Strange enough, but for ulterior motives, you see many of the nude uh, murals that you see in Pompeii were in the brothels. And uh, Basically, how they function so far, far as we can tell, you can see they're they're involved in a, in a variety of different sexual acts. Is it was kind of a menu or a showcase of what services were being rendered in this shop. But as you can see, still some pretty strict attention to detail. And well, what, I'll leave it up to you as to what they're doing. I'm showing you this here because for the for a good portion of the time after uh, the fifth century A.D., the fall of the Roman Empire. Well, it was actually, it, it, it was crumbling for a good long while, but if we were to give it a date, it would be after Alaric the Visigoth invaded. But by that time, Rome had already moved their capital to Constantinople. But the interest in preserving the classical uh, learning and arts were starting to wane. Uh, it was more about uh, surviving on a smaller scale. Uh, it came the rise of not just Christianity, but other religious uh, factions that discouraged uh, this earthly learning. They didn't think that studying the human figure or nature was really not, it really wasn't worth bothering about. Perishable goods, what was important was the year after, what was the hereafter. So it's safe to say that from, oh geez, from the fifth century AD up until the Renaissance, which is roughly 900 years, that learning stopped. I deliberately put this in to show you just the, how, how the mighty had fallen from that Liakalon sculpture to just, just mere centuries after, how the human figure just became almost cartoonish, disregarded, something that wasn't worth study. And we're going to look at the rebirth of that, um, starting in Renaissance Italy, specifically Florence. Here's a good example of how figure drawings were done in medieval times. The Zodiac Man. Now, it's not like the medieval man didn't have an understanding of human anatomy. 
they did. They just had a very difficult time conveying it onto a two-dimensional surface. As you can see, they, the concept of perspective and the separation of light and dark and proportion are pretty much lost here. It's just a caricature by and large of what a human figure would look like. Without getting too much in the weeds, there was a rise of humanistic philosophy, an appreciation of using a human philosophy to solve human problems, seeing things in human terms. It wasn't that they were turning away from the church, but they were seeing things from a more secular level. The, the place where all of this was happening was in the city of Florence in the late 1300s and early 1400s. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, it was the Dubai, the Tokyo, the New York and London all tied up into one. It was one of the most powerful, richest cities in the world, and it was ripe for artistic development and expression. Prior to Florence, this was something you would generally see. Nude figures were by and large during the Middle Ages used to depict uh, expulsion from paradise, shame of their nakedness. You can see the sad faces of Adam and Eve as they're covering their, their genitalia as the archangel is evicting them from the Garden of Eden. And you also see them in images where characters are being damned to hell. Very seldom do you see them in any other um, manifest. They're either expelled from paradise or they're being condemned to hell. But they, they, that's the only time in, the middle, in, in, in any art in the Middle Ages where the, the naked human figure is depicted. And then we look at 1425, this very same depiction by Masaccio. And there's a clear appreciation for the human figure and how it is depicted on a two-dimensional surface. So we have this drama here. Adam is covering his face in shame. He's not even covering himself up. It's clearly the nude model, the weight of the figure as he's moving forward. He's just sort of dragging his feet out of the garden, the, 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 the whale coming out of, of Eve's mouth. And the, this very strange uh, image here, these lines like, like voices out of a cartoon, the, the God saying, and stay out in some strange comical way. So what was going on in Florence at this time? Well, there was a rebirth, again, of the appreciation of the human figure. And the Greek understanding of the human figure was, was being relearned. They, they, they had a very strong affinity to the, 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 classical, um, the classical world. Leonardo was a good example of this. Here especially in Italy, and it might have something to do with the fact that they, growing up in Italy and seeing a lot of the Roman artifacts, you see a lot of things on the monumentous scale. It was believed by the Renaissance man and in ancient Greek times that man was the measure of all things. Here's an example. This is Leonardo's depiction of Vitruvian man. This is actually, wasn't his invention. He's just retelling uh, a depiction by uh, Vitruvius, and that you can that a human being, by just their simple range of motion and being, can depict. It's it's rather far fetched to be able to look at it, but these perfect geometric forms, and, and truth be told, we're really not that far off now, uh, at least in this our standard way of measuring things. Right? It was a monarch who. Um, the length of his foot was the length of 13, what would be an inch, would be a, a portion of his thumb. His favorite walk was 5,280 paces, which was a mile. And we all just kind of take it for what it is. But again, unlike the previous millennia where the Bible was the, the be all end all, the, the curriculum was, would explain everything. Now we're looking at things from a more humanistic term, that the human body and the human perspective and the human vantage point and philosophy and sensibility would be the template for which we would measure, well, everything, art, space, the universe. And this, this uh, drawing is, a, is an embodiment of that. It's one of the pure Renaissance drawings. If you break it down, Leonardo sets that just all these proportions mathematically uh, are uh, harmonized. 
Leonardo da Vinci was one of the first true figure drawers. It's not the best resolution, this drawing, but here's a study of a, of a back of a male, very soft, delicately done with a, with a genuine light source, but a, a strong emphasis on the anatomy of the back, how the light, not only just what's on the back, not like the Zodiac man, but how the light affects the, the, the human figure in space. There's another example of Leonardo's more thorough studies profile using colored paper. Leonardo was a, was a fascinating character in that he had, he didn't see drawing as a subordinate art form to other forms of art that were a means to an end. He, he saw drawings in and of themselves uh, were fascinating to him. In fact, he, he kept most of his drawings. We're talking like 2,000 pages. Now, when he left Italy and went to Paris to work with the king, he brought all of his drawings. He found them that important. And if you look here, now we're starting to see, think about that previous medieval Adam being expelled from the garden. Now look at this. He's getting into not just the, the, the muscles of the deltoid, but all, the way they're activated, where the light rakes across them. You're also looking at the muscles that are going into the scapula, teres major, trapezius, latissimus dorsi, external oblique. Again, we're getting back into that realm of appreciation for the human figure and proportion of the human figure. You can see him kind of struggling or doodling here. He kind of stops. You see that he's drawing the figure and he kind of does this crude drawing and then kind of ends, but then he really starts digging in here. Speaking of digging in, one of the great figure drawers, well, artists in general, one of the true rock stars of the Western world of art was Michelangelo. And uh, I think that everything he touched ended up being famous, <laughs> suffice to say. One could argue he was the greatest artist that ever lived. Um, he was, in his time, the greatest sculptor of his lifetime, and one would argue probably the greatest sculptor that ever lived. And then he was... Uh, the greatest painter that made the, one of the most famous, if not the most famous, magnum opus painting uh, of the Sistine ceiling. And he was one of the great draftsmen as well. He comes from the same ilk of Leonardo. They both believed that it was important for a painter to know how to draw. And I, I follow this uh, vehemently. Um, I can trace my artistic lineage back to these, to these, these men. I mean, I could trace Mark Sissing Lane back, yeah, pretty much to the studio in the Renaissance. And uh, we follow the same tenets. And I always tell my students, uh, I always encourage them to take a drawing class before a painting class. And I'd rather they take a figure drawing class before they get into painting. Because nine times out of 10, it's always a drawing problem with the painting. And if you can draw really well, well, you can paint really well. Here's an example of uh, one of his drawings. You'll see a lot of... Uh, artists in Italy using this dark red terracotta. It's called burnt sienna or, or simply terracotta. The, this medium is just clay that came from Tuscany, uh, mainly from Siena, burnt clay that they just turned into charcoal pencils. And it gave this beautiful, rich, dark sepia tone. This um, drawing here uh, is, a, is a study for one of the figures that are in the Sistine Chapel. I believe it's one of the Sibyls. Michelangelo was um, a, a strong advocate of not only the, the human figure, but the male nude figure. He would go as far as that the male nude figure was the ideal template for all living things. He didn't do much with the female figure. Um, unfortunately for his sensibilities, he thought the female figure was just flawed and wasn't worth his discussion. In fact, he just thought as a lot of times he would take a female figure and try to, um, well, masculinize it with, with uh, male um, features to, well, in his mind, make it better. This is one of the drawings, perhaps one of the most famous drawings in Western art. I've been blessed enough to be able to get access to this drawing when I do lectures at the Metropolitan Museum of the Delphic Sibyl, Olivian Sibyl, and um, about the same time, 1510, sepia, and it would be large. You'll see the, this image in the Sistine ceiling. One of the things Michelangelo did as well was he really challenged his models, put them in these compromised twists. Look at the neck. The, the, the head is turned nearly nine degrees. You can actually see the, the, the skin rotating here. You see the thorax twisting. Here you have 
from the sacrum all the way to the cervical spine is a twist. It's a highly unnatural uh, pose, but it's so beautifully rendered. Again, think about the, the jump from where we were in the previous 700 years. And you can also see Michelangelo is, is struggling with other things. So this toe is bothering him. So he keeps drawing this toe. If you ever look at this Sybil, this toe, it'll all make sense. I, I didn't, this is foreshortened hand. Then he's looking at other aspects of this. You'll, if, you, if you look at this, if you're fortunate enough to take my class and we get, well, we have to really do another field trip out to the Met. This is roughly nine by 12 inches, this drawing. And then this was blown up uh, to be a 10 foot um, fresco. You can actually see the pouncing holes from the pouncing wheel when they transfer this over to the wall. Another artist that I like to show from this period, these were, uh, well, they were the triumvirate. It was Leonardo, Michelangelo and Raphael. Raphael also did a lot of new uh, models and studies. This was done in ink using cross hatching, as you can see. Unlike the sepia, this is all straightly linear in the weight of the line. And he was a stickler for not just catching the human figure, but catching it in action. Look how activated this is. It's one thing to have a figure just sort of sitting in a chair, but every single figure here is engaged. He's pulling back. This guy's falling forward. He's ready to take a straight. This guy, even when he's on the ground, he's, he's not static. His head is turned. Beautiful, beautiful drawing. And unlike Michelangelo, Raphael was a ladies' man and had a strong appreciation for the female figure, as you can see here. This is a study from one of his paintings done in sepia. He captures the, the, the delicate contours, even the muscle tone, it's still very soft. That beautiful face. Turned away at three quarter view. It may very well be the same model depicting three different women. Uh, it's, it was less expensive. I know I do that whenever I have a, a project. And then he would just create some variations to make them look like they're, they're uh, different individuals. But as you can see, using that red chalk, the strong emphasis on proportion. And this is another thing that Raphael uh, taught. And this is something I teach my students. He strongly believed that the, human, the, the entire human figure can be broken down to a series of what we call bald heads. All these round form. There are no straight lines in the human figure. They're all, and there are no concavities. Everything is just a series of convexities and extrusions of ovals that overlap. And this is the end result. Absolutely stunning. I show this because it, when the figure was being resurrected in its appreciation in Italy, um, it wasn't exclusive to Italy. A lot of uh, the, the artists from Northern Europe wanted in on this, such as the, um, the Flemish master, Peter Paul Rubens. He was known, well, this is a good one. This was done, well, a little more than a century after uh, the previous, this he was a, a northern painter up in the Netherlands and a highly successful one. The man uh, was the antithesis of the starving artist. The man had castles, several castles. He had an entourage. He would have a live band performing while he was uh, making art. Quite often, he was uh, he was booked for months, sometimes years. And he also had an appreciation for voluptuous, voluminous. Uh, Female figures. You, this hence the term Rubenesque. You just have these these buxom, voluminous figures. So there's one female. She's uh, her her head is being uh, obscured from this towel, like she's pulling her, her her dress off. But you can see that again the the Greek classical and now Renaissance appreciation of 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 what we call contrapposto, the way the the weight is stacked. You have the the shifting of the hips and the shifting of the torso, and then it all kind of balances out. She doesn't look like she's falling over. It's all very well balanced and it's very dynamic, this beautiful form. So this is charcoal with white chalk with a little bit of red. Rubens liked to mix red and black. He's one of my favorite figure drawing artists. But anything about Rubens, he had a very peculiar um, possessive, uh, possessiveness about his drawings. He never showed them in public ever. Uh, we were never meant to see these. In fact, in his will, he requested 
three things. One, that all completed works be sent to the patrons. Two, incomplete, that all incompleted works uh, be completed by his assistants and sent to the patrons. And three, all surviving drawings of his were to be destroyed. Luckily, nobody had followed up on three because his drawings are phenomenal. As you can see here, we're starting to see another evolution in the figure. It's very earthy. It's much more rooted it's a, it, uh, than, the, uh, than the previous. And that might have to do with the Northern sensibility of God being in the details. The, Rubens went down to Italy to study the human figure, but you can't, you, you can take the artist out of the Netherlands, but you can't get the Netherlands out of the artist. The, the Netherlanders, the Northerners believed that God was in the details and they were, they were highly, um, highly driven in, the, in that regard. They like to, if you look at works by Van Eyck and Bruegel and, and well, Rubens, see a strong uh, attention to detail of nature. That's also shown in the figure. He also had a flair for the heroic. So he had these voluminous females, but he also has these voluminous males. These large rolling muscles going across the backs are this foreshortened, because this is all done in charcoal. Again, you can see some white to catch the highlights. I mean, he's, whether his models looked like this is anybody's guess, but he knew that the muscles were there and he took artistic license. Now, as an artist, I, I'm often, um, I see things from a different, prism than a lot of people do when they look at works of art. Most people will look at a work of art like this and go, oh my goodness, that's marvelous, and then move on. All I can think of is, how did he do that? And how can I do that? Look at this depiction of this foreshortened leg. As it's this leg here completed on this side. So he has this knee resting on the ground, and then this entire shin, and then this buckled, extended foot with the toe spread out here. This is marvelous in and of itself. And again, he's showing, he's showing that he has uh, Italian figurative chops, but he's using his, his uh, Northern uh, sensibilities as well. And this is one of my favorite drawings. And when I do give a talk at the Morgan Library, I, I ask the librarians to bring this drawing out of the male, the uh, seated male youth. Stunning, stunning drawing. Uh, charcoal with white chalk on off white paper. Uh, a lot of the white highlight has been as faded uh, as uh, a good deal. This is probably a much more darker and much more contrasting figure drawing. I love the foreshortened folded leg and the look at the clasp. Look at those fingers. Every single one of them from top to bottom, even the thumb. And then the head turning up as he's praying. This was a, um, ah, it escapes me at the moment, but this was a model of a, a, a painting of a martyr uh, as he's about to be, um, was it St. Sebastian? Could have been St. Lawrence. I'm not entirely sure. I have to look it up. But the seated male youth was, this was used as a template for a painting that he did uh, later on. But yeah, Peter Paul Rubens, someone to explore. Far cry from the bird man, would you say? And then later on, we have another medium, from one of the more famous artists, Rembrandt. This is a female nude. Again, not idealized, at least um, maybe idealized in Rembrandt's eyes. It's hard to tell. It's interesting because she has she looks very she looks very much like him in this picture. One one would even argue that might even be a, a female self portrait of him. But look at this beautiful depiction of this. This is all ink, all done in line, like an etching. This is all linear, if you could zoom up and see. And that's how he de de depicts all of these different tones. So the light source is up here, raking across. This gives us the opportunity. So this can be an etching, to be a print. Also, you have this very, very she's, a, she's smiling. Like be uh, an ancestor of the Mona Lisa. And there's always this mystery, what's she smiling about? <laughs> Some did Rembrandt tell her a joke, who knows? And then there is this, again, for all of my students that are watching this, this beautiful foreshortened raised shoulder, foreshortened receding forearm, well, for receding upper arm, and then the, the for, then the foreshortened forearm coming back. Create that effect. Absolute marble. Again, ink on white paper. And then he also did more subtle pieces like this one. 
This is, some would argue that this is a much more expressive piece than the previous. This is a, 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 a sepia wash. So this is a, basically a, a, a quill to get the lines and one, two, maybe three values. If you squint, it's still just beautiful gestural uh, pose of a female nude figure. Can't really tell what she's, she's zoned out. When, one could not say that this is a, um, uh, she's not engaged with us by any chance. It's hard to say. The ink here was probably from the cuttlefish. You have bister ink and you have sepia ink. The sepia ink is it was was from the cuttlefish. It was this beautiful, earthy, cool tone. Then you had bister ink, which was the previous. It's another Rembrandt, male nude. Again, would become an engraving which means that all of these lines would be mimicked onto a, onto a plate and this could be sold at, uh, en masse. Artists got wise to uh, the printing scene. It's, it, and to be perfectly honest, I totally understand because you can, it, smaller, more affordable pieces of art can be shared. I love that the head is turned away. And again, um, all pure line. With attention to the weight on the arm, and how this all—I I think it, 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 it poses a pretty good visual convincing argument. So this is Rembrandt, 1646. So I wanted to show you some examples of not just charcoal and and and, and uh, other drawing mediums like um, terracotta or burnt sienna charcoal, but uh, you have also ink, not just linear but washes of ink like the previous showing you that um, this tradition is starting to continue there's a much more delicate approach here uh, this maybe 50 years later Francois Boucher uh, he worked quite often these were studies for paintings um, it's probably from a live figure model I liked using Boucher as an example to a lot of my students these subtle uh, contours really not outlines but these contour lines to create volume and the use of white chalk to capture the highlights. I mean, the, the, the white chalk used around the patella and the base of the tibia here, just very convincing. And then laying off it in this very vague shadow. And if you squint, it's just, it's just a, a, a beautiful piece of itself. 1742, Francois Boucher. And then we go to what I consider one probably the titan of figure drawing and one of my heroes. He was known, strangely enough, not as a draftsman, but as a great painter at his time. And his paintings have all but pretty much been, let's say, forgotten for the most part. We don't think of Pierre Paul Proudhon is a hero in the world of academic figure drawing, and I'll show you why. Now, you look at Boucher, and you think about this medium, where he took it, and Proudhon ramped it up. He was a stickler for the use of, 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 of white chalk on tone paper with uh, different tones. And he came up with these beautiful figure drawings. Again, in and of themselves, I, I, I always parade this drawing out to my students whenever I get a chance to take them to the Met. This looks very simple. This foreshortened arm, and this very delicate recess into the space, and this head isn't even isn't even in any detail. We don't know what she looks like, but it's very convincing. And then the white chalk is stumped and not mixed in. This is the mistake people, is that the they're not mixed in with the charcoal. They kind of stop and then the, the light from the paper creates some of these recesses. And if this wasn't, I love the little highlight here with the bone of the, uh, the elbow attached because it's the closest to the light. It's just a stunning drawing. And the funny part was Proudhon wanted to save some paper. This is the most popular drawing of the two, but there's a drawing in the back that is seen, that, get, that gets less sunlight. And it's this guy. This is, a, this is the very same piece of paper. This is on the opposite side of this male drawing. Again, an incredible, I, I could stare at this all day. I'm constantly looking at his technique. I noticed that before he stumps using a shading stuff, meaning they actually use a piece of, um, tapered cardboard and kind of 
smudge these out here. He creates these lines. But look at this. This is very close to the way it turns in the light. And this is funny because this is the B side of that of this painting. This is the most popular drawing, probably uh, in the collection uh, of of Goudon's work in the museum anyway. And this is on the back. You'll notice too that it's off. This is yellow because it gets more. It was exposed to more light. I'm not sure what the provenance was of this, but this was likely in a frame in some manor house, and this was hidden in the back. And then you have this example, probably influenced by the fall of Adam, the Sistine ceiling. This was uh, done again in the uh, early 1800s, 1820s. Bear in mind that the camera did not exist this time. And again, I look at these, and this is where I really like The incomplete aspects of this show me how he does it. I managed to make a copy of this piece for my thesis. Um, you're free to look at it if you ever get a chance to go to the atelier. It's in my studio, but this was something I worked on for weeks. Same thing, off tone paper, shellacked paper, stumped charcoal, stumped chalk, and a very careful approach to how much white is used. He's not using the same highlight down here. So students, be warned. You don't want to get carried away with this, um, this white highlight. He's very, very meticulous about the hierarchy of light and how it rakes across the human figure. This one, um, he doesn't really get too caught up with the, with the white marker. I saw this in person back in 1997. And there's very little white that's used at all. But you get the impression it was a cloudy day. It's a very, very delicate and soft. Look at these reflective lights under the breast capture that. So the ambient light is hitting from underneath. Some very dark reflective light here. And this very delicate, I mean, this face is very simple. This ability to just economize these values to create this effect, this volume just coming off the paper. We can see slightly, slightly smudges around here to push this form out. People say things like, oh, it looks just like a photograph, which drives me nuts. No, it doesn't look like a photograph. It's way better than a photograph. Hammer doesn't know what it's looking at. Problem with a photograph is that it's, the lens only goes by what it does. It prioritizes everything equally. Here, you, the artist is who, who dictates the focus. One more from Proudhon. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm showing him a lot because I like to show my students uh, what to aspire to when we start doing these academic drawings. Now, it's not, we don't always do it, but when we do, this is the man that we usually, uh, we, we follow up on as, as far as the classical masters go. What I usually do too is I, I assign the students uh, drawings to explore an artist to look at and to take a stab at making a master copy. Now, here's the fascinating thing. All of these drawings, every single one of these, was not meant for public view. They were never displayed, despite all the work that was done on. Again, he was known for his paintings and he was successful up to a point until the fall of Napoleon. And uh, well, then things kind of went south for him. If I'm not mistaken, he died very humbly. But thankfully, his drawings survive. Speaking of which, um, we have one more master I wanted to show you of this era, uh, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ong. Some people call him Ingres. It's Ang Ong. It's a very interesting way to pronounce. He was uh, another French academic artist. Uh, this is a drawing he did in um, graphite, believe it or not. Now, this is an important thing to point out was the advent of the graphite pencil, well, where it came to be. And it was some say, some argue that it was created by a man by the name of Conte, who created the Conte crayon. This is important because charcoal started taking a back seat when Napoleon came to power because he needed the carbon to, he was too busy trying to take over and blow up half of Europe. So he needed the carbon for cannonballs. So that left artists in a lurch. They needed to find other ways to create. And Conte came up with a brilliant idea of cutting graphite with clay, 
creating what is now the lead pencil. And this is where Ong really excels. This is darker than what you would usually see from an Ong drum. What I really love about this is the expressions, the very, I mean, he's not going through a ton of one, two, one light value, two, three values tops. It's just this economic use of light and dark, this awesome heroic pose on this fellow here, that hero stance, can't beat that. And the contour lines push out the volumes. Again, a lead pencil, so to speak. There is, I should point out, you may know this, there is no lead in a lead pencil. They're all made of graphite and clay. And the designation, if you see H, means that it's a hard lead, which means there's uh, less range but more control. B means it's a softer lead, uh, softer uh, lead, which means that it's uh, there's more range but less control. Here's an observational drawing he did. It was probably done for a, a patron later on. Most likely never shown in public. All of these drawings by and large were never meant to be seen. That, that happens later. And then we have this rather interesting drawing, which I, I'm wondering whether he did two women at, this, at different times, because this is very what we call matter. This figure, this is a, this drawing in graphite was meant as a template for one of his more famous paintings called the Odalisque, which is, it was a, um, a, ha a woman in a harem in Turkey. But if you can see this, the proportions are really, for a man that really understands the human figure, it's getting very surreal here. This is a very long arm. And this, this may be a foreshortened waist, but it's pulled out. It's kind of like a, one of those long rubber dolls. And then there's this, she almost seems like she doesn't have any bones here. That being said, I love this drawing. Sometimes it's not all about nailing the anatomy, but, but the, the feeling that it elicits, the response. And that's what makes great art. It's not all about just getting the right shadows down. It's the bottom line is we're affected by art, not technically, but, but emotionally and how it moves us. And this is an important picture I put in here leading up to our next part of our lecture. Um, this is the view from the window of Le Gras. This is the first uh, truly developed photo, uh, 1826. Changes the trajectory of art forever because we start to question what is the role of the artist? What does this mean for the artist moving forward? That you know, we know, is there a place for the artist now that there is a camera? Is it, are, are we at the, end the, at the end of the line? And um, well, this is in 1826, and we're going to explore what happens, not just in figure drawing, but well, the history of figure drawing is the history of art, by and large. But this development changes the way we approach art moving forward. And uh, we'll talk about the, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, the advent of the camera, and its in impact on art. We are back. Okay, Randall, we do have one question. Um, it's actually about the previous section, so sure. I'll read that out. Um, there seems to be a resemblance between the figures on playing cards and Roman drawings of faces. Do you have an opinion? I do. I think that was, that was solely an, an aesthetic judgment call, because if you, it's funny you bring up playing cards. So the, the history of playing cards or the, the design of playing cards as we see them, we, we, we kind of reg, regiment them the way they are now. But prior to that, it was, it was like the Wild West. There were all sorts of different ones, the way they were depicted, um, the, way they were, um, uh, the, the way they were drawn, the, the, the techniques, the sizes of them. In fact, uh, the, the jack, this is something I digress, but the jack is actually designed uh, by the Americans because uh, the original uh, rank of the jack was the knight, but the problem was, was they couldn't put a K, a Q, and then another K on a card. It would have been confusing, so they changed it into a jack. But as far as the faces go, yeah, there might have been um, some of some leaning towards the uh, the archaic faces that you see. Uh, the Queen of Hearts definitely has the face of uh, of, of Psyche or Venus de Milo. Might have been academically trained. But I might have also been, it's a, from, from a vantage point, it's still, uh, it, it's, 
yeah, there's still some, there's some resemblance there. Very interesting take. It just, it was just brought to my attention at the break that my father is joining us from all the way from central Florida. Um, coincidentally, happy birthday, dad. Thank you for joining us. I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, you can see the fruits of your labors this evening and, uh, and, uh, Hope you hope you like what, what what's uh, being produced today. Now we're back. You might notice this is the um, this is the painting that that drawing was based on the odalisque. And looking back, it's still quite it's very interesting, very surreal to me. I don't know. I I really love this, and it's not enough for that. But you look at the way he paints the uh, the fabric and the way the forms uh, rest. It's just, the figure almost seems secondary. But that I love the face on that beard. Part three today. Figure drawing. Masters of the post camera to modern era. Now we're going to be doing a, a bit of a, a, a shallow dive of examples of artists and how they um, confronted this issue. Because again, the camera, and just imagine it, the camera was to the visual artist, what let's say the 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 motor the the motorized vehicle was to the blacksmiths. What what where do we go from here? Or are we at the end of the line? What what comes of art in general? What happens to figure drawing? And figure drawing is a really interesting how it responds because what happens is artists they find a way to beat the camera at its own game. Let me show you this picture by Robert Cornelius. The first this is a fascinating. Um, photograph the first self-portrait first first successful portrait 1839 so this was in a contemporary of all so again where do you go from here that stunning face a serious look on his face here i like that picture good looking dude so i guess you're gonna be the first picture you might as well crush your crush it right <laughs> and i just imagine now that how the, how obsolete this is i mean how many selfies are taken on a daily basis? This is the one picture of this man from 1839. The picture, the Robert Cornelius picture, changed everything. Changed uh, the, well, uh, artists were having an existential crisis. What do we have now? We have this, this I mean, we're, we're having it to some extent now, right? AI, what, and what's, what's the artist's place now that we have artificial intelligence cranking out these somewhat, uh, Arguably beautiful works of art, something more beautiful than some artists can make. But I guess every time there is a shift in technology or development, there's always going to be this, this, this um, conflict. So let's look at some of the artists and see what how they responded to this. I want to show you this interesting painting um, by Edward Manet, Luncheon in the Grass. Uh, it was a source of great scandal. This is now well, maybe 20 years after that photograph, but the times are starting to change. If you look at this painting, what would you say is particularly, what, what would you say is unusual, peculiar about it? It's interesting when I bring this up because a lot of people just kind of look at the painting and they, they gloss right past it, but I'll save you the time. Uh, the, the one odd thing about this painting is she's naked, just arbitrarily naked. <laughs> I don't know if it's a visual joke. I'm not sure if this was a, a, a social statement. Here are, here are her clothes. And she's just, these two men are having this discussion and this woman's taking a bath in the back and this woman's just, just bunched up in this trio, naked in the conversation. So I guess there's this thing, well, this is something that was created from Manet's mind. This is something that a camera could not, unless you found the actors, you couldn't dictate it. This is my... He was kind of countering this, um, this new movement. You know, for the first, I've looked at this painting for decades. Just uh, decades, I've never noticed. There's a little, little bird up here, little robin. Learn something every day. Uh, this is a drawing by Manet, a figure drawing, very gestural. Uh, this is probably a study for a drawing that he was doing, but you can see that he's really not getting too caught up in detail here. He's just trying to get all the, just enough information to get his point across. I'm not entirely sure if I like this drawing. Yeah, I do. I think from a from a from a basic standpoint, he's got a lot of stuff going on. This nice foreshortened wrist uh, pointing back. I love the way the torso uh, is portrayed that central axis, and then the weight being supported. 
mainly from the back to the hips. So this is um, terracotta on white paper, not of the same facility of say uh, Proudhon, but a well, nice drawing. A little later on uh, in this, the Impressionist era, but I should point out that the Impressionists such as Degas, Monet, and Manet, and Renoir, the term was pejorative. Um, it was used as a, well, as a harsh criticism of their lack of strict detail, impressionistic. It didn't give you uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of the information that earlier artists had. Here's an interesting reclining nude that Manet did. Um, very simple gesture, foreshortened hand, but then there's a lot of work. I love the way he creates these contoured lines, almost like slinkies going into the distance to create that recess into space. And as the arm presses up against the torso, the bicep and the tricep kind of, well, they have nowhere else to go but out. And then this very obscure uh, image of the face, this locked knee. I love this. I, I love the, the diagonal. You don't see a lot of diagonal reclines. They're usually going straight across or, or they're standing upright, but to, to use all of this paper to get all this information. And, that fat, and, and the light source is almost coming from the, from the artist. Well, it's over their shoulder. Here's something you might not be familiar with. Early figure drawing by Vincent van Gogh. He was academically trained early on. Just did not see this as being um, an area that he wanted to pursue, but seemed to be capable. But just even here at this early stage, you start to see remnants of his voice, this strong, harsh outline, this boxy anatomy. These drastic angles. He's almost like he's a he's he's like made out of cardboard. Now, the, the only way this model can do this is if there's a strap that's hanging on a wall here. I, I couldn't get an artist to do this enough uh, at the Academy. I got to get a pulley system going on there. But yeah, this is an early Van Gogh showing his um, understanding of, of light and dark and reflective light, the dynamic um, range of motion of the human figure, how the weight shifts. Nice, nice drawing. You would never think it was a Van Gogh from what we know of him. This is another early Van Gogh. Again, even at this early stage, you start seeing the genesis of his style. I just love looking at early pieces. See, yes, sometimes, as Miles Davis, the great jazz musician, used to say, sometimes it takes a while for you to sound like yourself. I guess the same applies to visual art. It's not all about trying to paint or draw like Pierre Paul Proudhon. He's, Vincent Van Gogh wants to become Van Gogh. And you're starting to see just the, 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 the seedlings starting to hatch here. A little later on, one of my favorite artists of this era, I wouldn't name Brexley, I wouldn't exactly call him an impressionist, but he happens to fall under those contemporaries, was George Seurat. Known primarily for his pointillist paintings like Le Grand Jatt at the uh, museum in Chicago and the study at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is a study that he did of a young uh, male nude, young boy, for well, the bathers, I believe is the name of the painting. And what Seurat did was he used this Conte crayon on this uh, coarse paper. And he didn't really get caught up in detail. He was really more concerned about light and dark and its relation to space. And when I, one of my first art teachers, Richard Hall, God rest his soul, told me when I was struggling to look at the drawings of Seurat. And I didn't really think of much of Seurat at the time. Um, when he said it, whoops, but um, he said, look at the space and look at the form. And when you squint, you look at this and it's, it's a drawing, but and it has a photographic quality to it more than that. You're catching that, this moment in time. You know, I almost feel like I, I can see his torso uh, heaving and, and, and exhaling as he's waiting for uh, for, for the model to, for the artist to finish. And again, there's not a lot of, there's just enough information here that's convincing that this is a young boy, just the proportions, his head is exceptionally large. He's not, he's not really filled out. This is a boy's anatomy. 
just enough anatomy in the shoulder. <laughs> no hands, no feet. There's, uh, there's, if you squint, it's just quite convincing. And then there's this earlier piece that he did. And bear in mind that Seurat was also um, trained at the French Art Academy. He knew how to draw all that stuff, but he was, he was on his own path. See that this, he's again, concerned about light and shadow, but primarily form in space. So this beautiful lit female is just being, she's kind of being pushed out of the shadows here. And then you have this very delicate use. He's not using any particular stroke. It's kind of going in and out. Just enough information to tell you what's there. And honestly, this is the true essence of portraiture, in my mind, in my opinion, is to catch that basic general information. I mean, look at this face. Delicate that faces. But this is a face of a living person, a living woman. It's not, it's not a nobleman, it's not some queen, it's not some archaic queen or king that you would see on a card. This is a something that you can relate to. But yeah, I was using Conte crayon for that on white paper. Bear in mind, there's no highlight, no white chalk at all. This is just white paper, so it's a lot of dark. So they were trying to find ways around the camera, things that cameras couldn't do. There were some holdouts of the old world. Um, Charles Varg, who we uh, teach at the academy, uh, at, most ateliers teach at the academy. He, he was um, he was he, he was a stalwart in maintaining the classical style of academic drawing, and he created a group of a series of plates to get students acclimated to the French academic approach to the figure. And these are some of these some of these uh, plates. And some of our students actually copy these to, these, to this day. And I, I'll, I'll use them on occasion. Um, so yeah, these were circa 1880. Th these are a, a strong staple in the diet of academic uh, figure drawing to this day. Um, some use it more than others. Um, I use it occasionally. Um, and I, I usually, and I, I'll definitely use it when it's on request, but. You can see uh, Barg is, he doesn't want to lose that information while everybody's experimenting. And, and great, I'm, I'm so glad that he did because we use a lot of this information in our academic studies. Well, then we have the 20th century when all heck breaks, lo breaks loose in the art world. So when you think of 20th century art, it's all over the map. I'm going to try to keep it as, um, streamlined as possible, and for our purposes, uh, keep it within the trajectory of figure drawing and, and use some of the most noticeable names and see that each of them were their own, they were their own individual artistic movements. I'd be recognizing this early drawing, not remotely interested in anatomical uh, accuracy, but more concerned about the drama of the human figure, almost going back to um, primitive aspect. Some will even say an African aspect in art. You can see this, this uh, study here and how it was relayed in this famous painting by Pablo Picasso. See that arm, my little laser pointer on here. Way that elbow is pushed out. The women of Avignon Street. This was a brothel um, that I'm not sure he, what we frequented, but he is pushing the envelope here. He is not concerned about light and shadow and form and space, not concerned about orientation or perspective. This table is being turned up. You don't know which is this the right leg or is this the left leg? You also see that there are these depictions of African masks. This may be the same woman. It's, I'm not entirely sure it, this is how to interpret this painting. But you can see that Picasso is really pushing the envelope as far as where the artist places and creativity. And he's in a, in a strange way, it's not, it's, his Renaissance isn't going back to classical Greece. It's going to, to, to deeper roots. One could argue he's looking at the, the um, 
the caves of Lascaux or the tribes in Africa to these faces. I was always um, jarred by this painting ever since I was younger. Just these women seems, I mean, these prostitutes, they just seem so, oh, how would I put it? Unapproachable. The angles are so harsh. You, you'll, you'll cut yourself up. And then you have another artist uh, who's very popular, especially with the female figures and his patterns, this linear drawing. Almost, it's almost as if his name is Gustav Klimt, the Viennese artist, 1912, uh, a, a contemporary of Picasso. This um, reclining nude, kind of half dressed, it looks like the, or this blanket is pulling across wearing the stocking. It's almost as if Clint is keeping the same pen on the paper without taking it off. I'm just kind of following one line. But it, again, it, it's, he's not looking for photorealism. He's looking for a, a, a particular form of artistic expression that's unique. And Clint's drawings are very, very distinct, very linear, but it's very, very expressive. Here's another one. It's a pleasant surprise for a lot of students. I, I don't talk a lot of, of a lot of female artists. Um, well, here we are, one of the greatest of all time, Georgia O'Keeffe and her nude series of the early part of the 20th century. Some of these beautiful watercolor nudes. Um, these were introduced to me later in life. I always thought about her as her desert paintings and her flowers and a couple of the, the, the nice kids, but not a lot of organics. This is beautiful gestural watercolor, like this one especially. And these are in 1917. And again, George is trying to figure herself out. It's like every other artist is an ongoing task. But you can see that she always she has a strong sensibility for the, well, the human figure, especially the female figure. It's really amazing. There's a couple other versions, more abstract, flat. I like them. So bear in mind that what I do teach a classical figure drawing technique in my class. But ultimately, we're about making beautiful drawings. Sometimes um, the trajectory changes within, within a student and it would be, it, it would be doing a student a disservice by, by suppressing uh, that trajectory. Quite often I encourage it, which is very rare in an atelier environment. Some would even argue it's not an atelier, but in that regard. But I think that um, there, there should be room for growth and ex experimentation. Sometimes the experimentation, uh, well, blows up in your face, right? And then you go back to the drawing board. But it's interesting to look at these pieces. One of my favorite early 20th century artists, um, Amadeo Mogliani, especially his female nudes, he had these long, mannerist arabesques. He would have been a great popular artist back in the uh, late 1500s in Venice, I think. It's one of the mannerists. Again, you can see some very simple gestures. You don't even put eyebrows. You didn't put even pupils in their eyes. Some argued that Mondigliani kind of dehumanized his figures by not adding um, you know, eye contact, so to speak. But I think that it's in the form. You look at this, it, 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 this arabesque, beautiful curve, and how you can use this in your own work. Do you need to copy Mondigliani? No. In fact, he's taking this axis and he's creating this gestural drawing. It's very simple. I mean, I think that most students in my class, if they were to do a master drawing, they could bang this one out pretty simply. But simple doesn't mean easy. Mongoliani. Take a look at his paintings. They're, they're phenomenal. And then later on, and it had a much longer, well, a longer tenure than Mongoliani. Henri Matisse, this is a graphite, um, simple graphite drawing he did of a nude reclined. What's interesting, I wanted to show you this because you watched the evolution of his work. And again, this is, one could argue anti-photographic, but there's still a lot of volume here. One could argue that the space resembles uh, a specific person. Is he really caught up in proportion? No, nah, one could argue that there are some inaccuracies, but that's not what this is about. This is just about being a beautiful painting or beautiful drawing, rather. He doesn't prioritize between the jewelry, the anatomy, or the upholstery. It's all pretty much all the same to him. In a weird way, it's photographic like that. 
And then he gets a little more later on, gets a little more experimental. Seems like he's leaning more towards maybe we've seen a couple of Picasso's early works. They start pulls in and out. Again, you start seeing like the Modigliani, you have that arabesque, that curve. Even though it's blocky, there's a lot of gesture here. It's a lot of movement. And if you're looking to make movement in a work of art, you add diagonals and you add arabesques, which leads to this magnum opus. Is blue dancers. Think about this for a moment. Think about what we've seen from the Birdman to the Kuros to Leonardo's Vitruvian Man, Proudhon, leading to the most uh, in the past century is blue dancers. These very basic. I, I love this one in particular. I don't know, a, a couple. Of, I, I appreciate it. this particular dance where I like just flying in the air. Reminds me of the, um, it may be groundbreaking, but at the same time he's going back in time is almost a primitive aspect to this. You know, this looks a lot like something you would see on a Greek vase, right? Something you would see in, in the geometric period in the Greek sculpture, or you can go farther, something you would see back in the Paleolithic period 13,000 years ago. Now, I'm not entirely sure whether he saw these or not. I, my timeline is a little confused as to whether when these were discovered, but I can't help but think that um, if he saw these, that they didn't have some effect on this, but it didn't have to go that way. I mean, there are other examples, but just to show you, 13,000 years, we've come full circle. You can just paint these girls blue and they fit right in, one could argue. And then we have very interesting figure drawing. This P Peter having a wash by David Hockney. Uh, it's just a simple watercolor. What I like about this watercolor is, it, it, again, it, it's it's devoid of, of, of a lot of detail, but there's something very unique to it. It's something very relatable. It's turned away. There's almost a shyness to it. And it's probably the first figure drawing that I've seen in any medium uh, that has a tan line. And that, I mean, it's Bud is all pale because he's wearing this bathing suit and the rest of his body is being exposed to the sun. But I'd say of all the paintings going back to, uh, gee, Birdman, 17,000 years ago to now, this may be, I, I may be wrong, but this is the first time I've ever seen a, a, a tan line on a human buttocks. This was in 1967, two years before I was born. And then we have Lucian Freud, one of the great figurative artists of the 20th century. Um, a lot of tension in his work. Um, I'm hit and miss with his work. Some things I like, some things I don't. But that's okay. It's part of the artistic journey. And this is the tension in this figure trial. It's a barely make it out as a figure. It looks like a marionette with the strings cut and it's kind of thrown onto the, onto the couch. I don't think it was meant to be comfortable. There's nothing relaxing about his reclining nude. This isn't like Degas reclining nude or, or the um, nude by um, Boucher. This is a man that looks like he's, he may as well be on a torturing rack on a couch having a bad dream. But this is Lucian Freud. This is, this is what he, he reveled in, that tension, that stress. Everything looks like every painting or drawing from Lucian Ford looks like somebody's about to start screaming at any second. I love the way he handles the hand here in the four short thing. These are some examples of, of, of masters of the 20th century and, and how figure drawing, again, the evolution of it. Is that, is, and when I say evolution, uh, I don't mean a specific trajectory of of craftsmanship or talent. That's, I think that's a mistake. Evolution, it doesn't, it, 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 it ebbs and flows, it wanes. The, one could argue that Greco-Roman art evolved into medieval art. Some will say that, depending on your artistic sensibilities, that it declined. But there is a certain beauty to the medieval uh, aesthetic. And there's a reason why certain uh, certain genres are done in a certain way because it's responsive to the um like all art art is responsive to the 
the political and social and economic and scientific um, climate of its day. Would this have been acceptable back in the 1500s? Probably not. But in the 20th century, 21st century, everybody's um, speaking out, trying to make their own voice. Uh, absolutely. Epilogue. Where do we go from here? Have we reached the end of the line? Well, we've reached the end of the line of the lecture somewhat. Um, modern day figure drawing. What's going on? Well, is the tradition dead? Is the tradition alive and well? I would argue that it's doing very well. Here's an example of some of our modern masters, guys that I've worked with, guys that I've learned under, um, guys that I've taught with. Stephen Assell, one of the great, well, he's one of the greatest draftsmen and painters known to me. And I was fortunate enough to learn under him and uh, teach at the same facility and, and, and um, I haven't spoken to him, I own a call. This is a graphite on paper. Uh, I probably did this about 10 years ago. Um, using uh, classical techniques, but very, very, I mean, there is, this is modern. I don't think there's any mistake that this is a 21st century masterpiece. Well, he would argue it's not. I love the way Stephen does hair. Taught me how to draw hair. And the way he just, this, the way he catches reflective light and the drama is that there, it's, it's not enough to just have the, the draftsmanship that, that there's just, there's poetry here. Four shortened arm, the way he just economically does these fingers foreshortened and the knuckles that recess in the space. Ah, it's incredible. Then he's using some colored pencils and color, different colored charcoals here. This is a little earlier. Um, white paper uh, with some terracotta, and I think he was using a little green and black. He also takes a razor blade to uh, pull the colors out to create these, you know, these, these pubic hairs. He does that as well. In other words, he'll pull out, he, he'll pull out just as much as he puts in. So he probably took an eraser to pull this vein out. Stephen Assell teaches at the New York Academy of Art and occasionally he does uh, um, workshops. Maybe I'll get him at the Academy one day or the Atelier. And there's some smaller versions of the same work. Beautiful back done in graphite on tinted paper. Uh, I believe this is ink and this is graphite. That's Stephen. So, yeah, there's still some figurative artwork going on. Uh, we also have Mike Grimaldi, another man I've been fortunate enough to work under. He teaches at the he is the he's the chair of drawing at the New York Academy of Art. He also, I believe, his wife runs is the director of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art. He teaches at both facilities. Um, this is a charcoal on chalk paper. Absolutely stunning. Quite a, quite a far cry from Birdman, I must say, because it's not enough that he has this, the figure alone, but the figure in this environment. It's a beautiful approach, his attention to detail, but really the way he handles light, it's soft northern light, it's not harsh, catches just enough to create these impressions and, there's no dis mistake. Think about the Lucian Freud painting, uh, drawing and this one. This one's a very, the Lucian Freud reclining man and Romaldi's reclining woman. Just the, the tension isn't there, not the same. There's another uh, charcoal by Grimaldi. Grimaldi also, I mean, we also learned under Stephen Assel, so you might notice the hair, but this absolutely stunning approach to this bright light hitting the back, quite often I'll have my students doing back, uh, back studies, but the way that, again, the hierarchy of light, so this, it's getting hit with light here, but as it gets farther away from the form, it starts to recess. And then as this portion of the anatomy of, by the sacrum pushes out and the hips, then it catches light again, and then it recesses beyond the buttocks. And then Patricia Watwood, was uh, also, she teaches at the New York Academy. She's also been um, exhibited all around the world. She's a figurative artist, does a lot of portraiture, but she also does a lot of figurative work. See some of Ong's influence on some of uh, Patricia's work. See the white chalk on the blue tinted paper. This is just watercolor. See that? It's a watercolor wash, 
And then she drew over this probably with graphite and then white chalk. And then she did this lovely study. My apologies for the resolution. I thought that was a better play. I remember when she did this. The Academy of some demo. Sepia. Not sepia, sorry. Burnt sienna on off-white paper with a little bit of white highlight to capture that. This is an exercise that I would have uh, my students do. As you can see, it's not complete. It's not a matter of being complete. Nobody cares that it's not finished. <laughs> There's enough of it, I think, that, that drives the point home. As far as what's going on right now, uh, here's some images I wanted to, uh, to uh, showcase on my own students. I have a group of young figure drawing students, usually ranging from 16 to 21 years old. That's the core group. Um, this is some of the work that we do together. She's using a, 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 a Sienna Conte crayon. She's doing a back study. That's uh, Hannah. This is my other two students. They're doing another back study. She likes to use the Sienna. She's using graphite. She's using charcoal. Mind you, when I first had these students uh, on board, uh, they didn't, they they couldn't begin to know how to approach uh, this subject. Fortunately, this information has been preserved. Uh, my artistic lineage can be traced all the way back to Renaissance Florence, and I teach all of this information to my students. And there's nothing I hold back on. Here's some other examples of, of my course students. Some other students uh, oh, with our model. Uh, working on a, uh, this was a three hour pose. See uh, graphite on paper. Uh, I think that's charcoal on paper. And then there's charcoal and white on paper. Some other examples of some figure drawings from the same core group. Again, these are from very young students. Uh, this is um, some burnt sienna, terracotta, and graphite, different model. And our and last week's class, where we were, uh, I had them depicting uh, um, the Princess Andromeda. Three different artists using three different mediums, expressing it, and they're all just absolutely lovely paintings, and they're just phenomenal students. And I'm looking to grow the group, and I'm looking to share this information. People are willing to learn it. And what? There's no better way to express, uh, to, uh, well, plug the class and to show some of my work. Um, this was a demo I did for the students on how to use white chalk on dark paper with an inverted light source. So the model was getting hit from the light from underneath, not below. And the trick was to, it, we were using the white pencil to accentuate the light. Because quite often when we're drawing, we're accentuating the dark. And this is an inversion of that. And this is the um, this was the end product. And then there was this object as well, where I used the model to create this star chart of the constellation Hercules. Uh, this one, fortunately, this sold uh, at Sotheby's at auction. That's a private. Uh, that's a um, an accurate star chart, by the way. I'm looking to do another one. But this none of this would be possible if it weren't for uh, a strong uh, foundation and anatomical uh, and dramatic figure drawing, which is what we teach. This is the information for the class if anyone is interested. Um, the, these, that on the left is one of my drawings uh, that belongs to a private collector. It's on Thursdays, six to nine at the Atelier Flowerfield, open to all levels. If you have any questions, you can reach me at info at randallium.com. You can also reach us at the Atelier Flowerfield at flowerfield.org. Um, we'll be more than happy to accommodate you. And that is the end of life for this uh, lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope this encourages you to explore um, figure drawing further. And hopefully, if you have a chance, you'll work with me. And uh, I can teach you how to do some of this stuff. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to post them in the Q&A. And um, I'll be available for a few more minutes to answer any questions. But thank you so much for joining me uh, on this uh, journey on one of my favorite subjects. Okay, we do. We definitely have one question here, Randall. Um, 
why nude art if human figure is the measurement of everything why is it the nude body why is the nude body not dressed your thoughts about that the philosophy at the time is the nude body was the purest measurement because we are we are born that way and we leave the world that way and that's that was the that was what was considered and the in the opinions of the classical world the nude figure was perfect in and of itself the clothing was flawed in fact one could argue at the well uh, in the Christ, in the Judeo-Christian world, the philosophy at the at Genesis was everything was fine until we fell. Adam and Eve had no clothes on, and they were doing fine up until they were corrupted, and then they were ashamed of their nakedness. And in a weird, well, not a weird way, but an interesting way, the the philosophy is is that the nude figure is something we aspire to. It is a pinnacle of beauty. It's something that we shouldn't be condemned. And, uh, and it's quite controversial. Not everybody was on board with that. Um, there are, are still some people not on board with that. There were popes that were not happy with the Sistine ceiling. Some even threatened to demolish it, thought it was corrupt. They thought it was more appropriate for a brothel. But the nude figure is the figure in its purest form. Um, it also... It, it gives us the opportunity to really look at the human figure as something that we all share because we all share the same anatomy. Um, and the challenges, it's such a hard thing to do. It's not easy. It's a challenge. It's, it is one of the, it's one of the pinnacle challenges of, of visual art to, to depict a human figure. Because even with, even if you don't have the training, you don't have the act, the, the artistic or act an anatomical wherewithal, you know, when a figure drawing is wrong, you know when a portrait's off, but if you can nail it, and that's an, that's just an amazing accomplishment. But for me, I just find it, it it's I just find it the purest form of 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 analytical drawing and expression, and uh, a celebration of the human condition. For me, so a lot of people may not be on board with that, but. It's one of my favorite classes to teach. It's one of my favorite. Whenever there's a live model available and I'm available, I'm there. Because it's a very rare opportunity to have that dialogue. But that's um, that's that's my two cents. <laughs> um, Vivian Papa says, thank you. Enjoyed the select selections. Thank you. Uh, wow. enjoyed, uh, love the selections. Sorry. Shit. What is your opinion about old masters uh, versus contemporary artists using nude figure as a tool of shocking the audience? My opinion? Mm. I, I believe that creating a work of art it, to shock in and of itself, um, that's pretty low hanging fruit, in my opinion. There are works that are great works that were shocking that did not take that's such an abrupt uh, end around. But I know what you mean. There's some time to where, at what point does it go from uh, controversial to uh, stylistic to pornographic? And, that, and that's a, an interesting line that we can discuss now, how that gets crossed. For instance, um, what one of the paintings that was considered outrageous in the early 20th century was Guernica by Picasso. Um, it depicts uh, a night raid where people were slaughtered during a bombing. And um, very interesting response because Picasso was confronted by, a, by, an author by one of the authorities and asked that you looked at the painting, and I'm not sure if this is apocryphal or not, and looked at the carnage that was in the painting. And he asked Picasso, did you do this? And Picasso goes, no, you did this. And I always found that um, jarring. It, art can be a very powerful, uh, a very powerful tool in that regard, and that's why when somebody does something controversial or jarring, it, it's it's okay to push the boundaries. Um, there are consequences for pushing boundaries, for better or for worse. Uh, I don't say not to. I, I understand. Like when I was in college, the Brooklyn Museum was under a, a great deal of fire for um, so, some of the uh, works that were being uh, displayed. Um, I'm of the school of, okay, um, I may not like it. In fact, I might find it uh, unnerving. However, um, 
I think that would be best to just, I don't think it should not be, I don't think it should be removed, but that's, that's my take. Um, I hope that helped. I hope that answers the question. I'll give it a minute to see if anyone has anything else they want to, any comments to make or, or uh, let's say. It co covers 17,000 years of drawing. So that, a fair um, amount. <laughs> fair amount. But it was, what is interesting to me is how there is this gap from the Paleolithic age. I find it fascinating that there is a no stylistic change in some of those caves that 13,000 years and then 4,000 years later, there'll be a restoration, but the style hadn't changed. I mean, 4,000 years of the same style. And just, the, the, it must've been a very, very unique way of seeing the world. I mean, they didn't have the same clock their pace, their, their priorities, their can they share the human condition like we all do. They probably joked around, they probably got jealous, they probably had fell in love and got into arguments. They just had a different template of, of what the world was to them. And I, I when I see that little bird man falling over by the bison, for me, I, I don't know, it's moving. I'm, I'm, we're sharing a, a human experience. We've all been there, whether it's a bison or a, I don't know, a, a, a four by four that almost ran us over. It's just a very interesting, uh, something that resonates with us. And I think that's why he, for us, for me, figure drawings resonate because we're, we're, it's every figure drawing is a dialogue between the model and the artist, whether they, they're speaking it or not. They may not even know you're doing it, but it's no surprise to me that every time I'm done with a figure drawing class, every time the, the model puts the robe on and runs around the class to see who drew what. Because they want to see how they impacted the artist in what way. And um, I don't know, it's, 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 a, it's a real privilege to me to, to be able to, to teach and to take that class. And I hope maybe one day, uh, if, if for, for those new to it or, or a little shy about it, to, to give it a try. And I think that you, you'll find a very fulfilling experience. Because for me, it's there's there's nothing like it. In fact, I, it's there's nothing better in terms of drawing. I love it, and uh, I like to share that experience with as many people as I can. And uh, I will say, uh, Randall is an excellent teacher. And if anyone is interested in learning from him, uh, the figure drawing class actually starts tomorrow for this session. But if anyone wants to sign up late, they're very welcome to. Um, you just have to call the atelier. Um, our number is 631-250-9009, and we'd be happy to uh, prorate any fee um, if you come in late. So don't feel you can't sign up because the session started. And I'll repeat that again. That's 631-250-9009. Uh, um, you can also contact Randall, and he will always get in touch with me. So. Um, I do urge you to consider it. As I say, he's an excellent teacher. I think you get a lot out of the class. Uh, and with that, I think we will wrap this up. Um, our next lecture will, I, I believe the next lecture is in July and it's gonna be a digital painting demonstration by a new young artist who we're hoping to bring on board as a teacher. She's also doing a workshop in the summer. Uh, that's Jenny Kim. And I'd also like to remind you of uh, our upcoming summer workshops um, of which she is doing one. It's gonna be a series of different workshops. Randall's actually going to be teaching a portrait drawing workshop on July 10th. All those things can be found on our website, atelier at flowerfield.org. Um, and uh, they will be interspersed throughout July and August um, along with our normal programming. Um, the other thing I would like to uh, let everyone know is tomorrow is the last day of our current exhibition which is a solo show by Kirk Larson. Wow, you got to see this. So he is hosting a closing reception um, with music and light refreshments. Everyone is welcome. And that's going to be from 5.30 to 7.30 tomorrow evening. Please look out for our emails about our lectures, exhibitions, and other upcoming events and classes. And again, as I said, everything is always available on our website and please feel free to call us. And uh, with that, I would like to thank Randall very much for yet another wonderful lecture. And uh, thank you all for attending. And uh, I wish you a good night. Good night. Thanks thank for joining us.